If you have your Bibles, iPads, droids, whatever you read the word in, uh, turn with me to Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22, I'm going to read verses 3 through 16. Apostle Paul was uh, in the temple in Jerusalem, and the Jews started stirring up trouble. They had made some assumptions, too. They thought he had brought some Gentiles uh, into the place where they weren't supposed to be. And um, anyways, they started stirring, stirring trouble, and he ended up getting uh, arrested. And uh, when they were about to take him in, he asked if he could address the crowd, and they gave him permission to do so. And at that point, Paul shares his testimony, and so I wanted to read that to you. Acts 22, I'm starting verse 3. I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Sicilia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way, he's talking about Christians, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers and I journeyed towards Damascus to take those who were there and bring them uh, in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, about noon a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, well, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, well, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, rise and go to Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me, and I came into Damascus. And one, Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour, I received my sight and I saw him. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. Now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So that's Paul's testimony. That's... That's his story, and he, he shared it on more than one occasion, and it's actually recorded a few times in the scriptures. Um, Peter says, we've been reading this passage each week, he says, in your hearts honor, the Christ, uh, honor Christ, the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, and that's exactly what Paul said. Uh, just did. How did, he, how did he give a reason for the hope that he had? He told his story, uh, where he was, how God interacted with him, and uh, where he is now. And so as believers, as believers, if we're a Christian here today, if we're a born-again believer, we all have a story. Let me encourage you, too. Your story is not boring. I've heard a lot of Christians say that. Well, I don't have much of a story. No, you, need a sto you have a story that other people need to hear. You think your story's boring? Well, there's some people that need to relate to that boring old story that you have. We all have a story. Where were you? How did God show up? And where are you now as a result? So this morning I wanted to share, as my, we close out this series on 25 reasons that I trust Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I wanted to close out by telling my story. This is my testimony. So I grew up in 
a Christian home. I was raised in church, and my mom uh, tried to instill that in her kids. We came from a, um, a broken home. She had been through uh, a couple of divorces. Her first uh, husband was abusive, and uh, so she struggled, right? And as you can imagine, that cr- caused brokenness uh, within the home. I'm the baby of the family. I came up, and mom was doing her best with the capacity that she had to uh, raise us in in uh, the best she knew how uh, to to seek Christ. The uh, Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. That is not a promise. It's a proverb. It's a, it's a rule of, of thumb that generally, if we teach our kids values and we teach them, we give them direction, you know, um, a lot of times they're going to turn out, they're going to heed that advice when they get older. They're going to remember uh, what their parents taught them and, and the example that their parents showed. And so my mom uh, tried to instill that into us. Um, I uh, recall as a child uh, walking down, down the aisle uh, on several uh, occasions during an altar call. Uh, one time in particular, I remember at Lakewood Church in the 80s uh, during a, a revival that we went to, I remember me and hundreds of others made the long walk from, um, from the seats uh, down to uh, the front uh, to receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And I recall, uh, yeah, I recall being baptized. Uh, I'm not sure. I think it was shortly after that. At our, we didn't go to Lakewood, so at our small church. Uh, my parents asking uh, for me to be uh, baptized, so I remember being baptized, and, and you know, Peter said at his sermon at Pentecost, he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So I had, I had taken all the steps that I understood uh, to become a Christian, but the truth was, is church scared me. Uh, church scared me. Uh, for one, we, uh, I grew up in, in very charismatic congregations. That's no knock on, on charismatic churches, just is what it is. I grew up in charismatic uh, congregations, and uh, we were in a, a very small church, church pe- full of people that love Jesus, and the leaders love Jesus, but man, it scared me, because uh, <laughs> it was full-on charismatic and, um, you know, people falling out and stuff like that, and, and I didn't know what to do with that. Uh, I also felt out of place because it was an older church, and as a young boy, didn't have many people to, to uh, relate with, so I struggled with that a little bit. And, um, but also, I didn't want to go to hell, and that scared me. Um, I didn't believe that my salvation was secure and that scared me, and this caused me a lot of fear and anxiety uh, when I was sitting in church. Um, I was afraid that the preacher, actually the preacher's wife, um, uh, she was a beautiful lady, but she uh, actually, she, you know, she worked in, 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 in prophecy, and so a lot of times she would call out people, but it was usually to encourage them or pray for them or whatever, but I just knew, like, she was going to see right through me and say, that boy's going to hell, you know, and I was afraid that she was going to call me out and, and say something, and, and, and it scared me. And uh, I didn't want to be there. I had a lot of anxiety. Um, on Sunday mornings, I would try and pretend that I was asleep, uh, and it never worked. It worked like a couple times. Mom would always knock on the door, and I'd have the covers and act like, you know, I'm deep in sleep or whatever. And she'd say, Scott, you know, wake up, wake up. But I've always had a weak conscience, and... Uh, so I would have to, you know, after she called my name the second or third time, I had to say, yeah. And she'd say, it's time for church. I'd say, okay. And so I knew when she shut the door, I better, I better get up and, and get going. Um, so that never worked. Um, and so we go, and I would sweat out yet another service. Um, the only thing I looked forward to in those three or four-hour services, it seemed, was uh, going to lunch at first. I always looked forward to going to the cafeteria uh, afterwards. That was an exciting time for me. Um, you see, I believed in the Lord, and as some of you know, um, the Bible says that even the demons, they believe in and they shudder, right? And I was definitely shuddering. I was, I was, uh, I was worried about my salvation. And uh, I believed in God so much that I told him every single night in the same ritualistic prayer. Um, 
I just had this, this prayer that I, I memorized right, where I was covering uh, all the bases, right? So that I'd make sure, you know, you know, the whole like, if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That was like just a part of mine. I had this long prayer that I, that I uh, chattered off every, every uh, night and uh, so that I wouldn't go to hell and so that when I went to sleep, I would be good with God and all my bases um, were covered. Um, So my prayers, they weren't a conversation with, with God. It wasn't a real uh, relationship. Jesus had said in Matthew 6, 7, he says, When you pray, don't heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they'll be heard for their many words. And so I was treating God more like a program, right, or a genie or something that I could just put input and just make sure uh, that he, he heard um, me, but I really wasn't talking to him from, from the heart, and so I was, I, was, I was scared of God. You know, Jesus, he said himself, whoever believes and is, and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe uh, will be condemned. And that, that scared me. So as I got older and um, in high school, my, my, my mother didn't make me go to church as much. I even got to experiment and go to another church and trying out a different church than than uh, they were going to. And uh, when I got to college, though, um, I began to think that my upbringing was over-religious. And uh, the result of that was an overreaction. I overreacted. Uh, it was a very slippery slope that I just slid all the way into. Um, Peter says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, and he saw a weakness <laughs> in me, right? He, he saw somebody that wasn't grounded, and he preyed upon it. I don't blame the devil. I never do that. It was all Scott, right? But uh, he was definitely uh, in action. <clears throat> I was experiencing uh, independence, uh, for the first time, first time away uh, from the house as, a, as an adult. And um, I started to think that I came from an over-religious household. Never lost believing that Jesus Christ was Lord and Savior uh, through all of my college years. Even you know, I, I can see the Lord uh, working even in that, dealing with um, teachers that were atheists and very uh, forward atheists and, and wanted you to be an atheist too. And, and God protected me, gave me a very, I've always had a very, uh, um, uh, I've always had a knack for thinking critically, right? And so I'm, I'm thankful that God uh, protected me um, in all that. Um, but I was experiencing independence for the first time. I thought I didn't need to go to church to be a good Christian. And um, I partied and got drunk a lot. Nothing wrong with having a party, okay? You all know what I mean when I say uh, party. Those weren't good parties. Uh, I was getting drunk constantly, uh, smoked pot. Um, and all the while, <laughs> living this lifestyle, I'm astonished when I find out that all my friends aren't believers, that was the first time I had been surrounded by people that weren't believers. I also want to preface this. I love those guys. I still love my old friends. Uh, I have a lot of good memories with those old friends. They weren't the devil, right? And um, I love those guys, but I was, I was around uh, people that were not, uh, that were not believers. Um, and I remember getting frustrated with them. The first time I found out, it was almost depressing, but then I remember after that having argument arguments with my friends um, about God while we're smoking and drinking. The um, Bible says, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Now, what Paul is, is saying here in 2 Corinthians, he's not saying that you shouldn't have unbelieving friends, but you should not be yoked with them. Do you all know what that means? You shouldn't... Um, you shouldn't be on even standing with them, right? Those shouldn't be your, your closest knit where you draw your wisdom from. Those shouldn't be the friends that you imitate, right? Um, do not be unequally yoked with, with unbelievers. Um, and I, I rationalized this lifestyle in my head by saying God knows my heart, right? God knows my heart. Uh, I think a lot of times when we're in those situations, it's easy to say, well, God knows my heart. He knows where I'm at. Um, but it was also easy for me to do so because I wasn't reading God's word. In fact, I was ignorant. 
I didn't even know God's word up to that point. I mean, I knew a few scriptures here and there. You know, I, every once in a while as a child, I'd open my Bible and read a few paragraphs here and there. But I really uh, had never really read God's word. Um, Proverbs 19.2 Desire without knowledge, listen to this, desire without knowledge is not good. Whoever makes haste with his feet misses his way. And so when we don't have direction from God's word, it's easy to follow our own passions and desires and to get ourselves into very slippery uh, places. And that's what exactly what I had done. I was also making God into my own image, right? When you're ignorant of God's word, it's also easy to make God in your own image. It's like, hey, this is, this is the God I serve. This is, this is the God I like, right? And not let him define himself, right? And um, so that's what I was doing. I had made God into my own image. He was, he was after the likeness of Scott. And so my sin eventually came back to haunt me as I slid further and further and I dove uh, deeper. Um, you see, uh, Courtney and I, we were high school sweethearts. We met, man, I met her, I think she was a freshman. I was a sophomore when I first met her. She was dating one of my best friends, actually, briefly. Um, but it wasn't until later, about a year later, um, I fell head over heels uh, for that girl. I just fell so in love with her, and it took me a year and a half to get her to uh, date me Initially, she wouldn't date me because um, um, because I'd broken up with a girl that was her friend, and her and I had dated for a while, and so she didn't want to, you know, she didn't want any part of, of that. But we became, in the meantime, we became really good friends, and I fell for her. And even when that girl, when that was long, long gone, uh, Courtney was afraid we were such good friends that she didn't want to ruin that. And um, so anyways, I prayed... Uh, I prayed to God for her. God, give me, <laughs> give me her, and I won't hurt her. I promise. And and um, and uh, eventually He did. And we 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 started dating the year after I graduated. It was her uh, senior year in high school, and and we started dating. And uh, I loved her. And we weren't married yet. We we dated for eight years, and we weren't married yet. But I I knew she was the one. And she knew I was the one, right? So we knew we were going uh, to get married. But we were also long-distance dating. We long-distance dated for like two years, um, two hours apart from, from one another. And mixing that with drinking, not a good thing, especially where I was and where my mind was. Wasn't in a good place. And I wasn't a faithful boyfriend. And this, this crushed me. It crushed me. I'm not playing the victim. I'm responsible, but it crushed me, and I would cry. <laughs> Sometimes I was drunk, and I would cry, and I would hear things like, you know, my some of my college uh, buddies were into um, during the late '90s. Um, Jerry Springer was a popular thing, <laughs> and you would hear always hear that phrase, "Once a cheater, always a cheater," and I would hear that, and I was like, "Yep, Scott, that's you." That's who you are. And um, I'd cry, but I became a slave to my sin. I became a slave to my lust. And uh, pornography and strip clubs were next and a part of my life. And uh, I ended up hurting those that I love most, including God. I was a huge hypocrite. I said I believed in God, but didn't represent him at all. My life didn't reflect it at all. However, I didn't know. I didn't know if I could stop. I was enslaved to my sin. Paul says in Romans 6.16, he says, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are a slave of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? I believe as Christians, we're set free. It goes on to talk about that freedom that we have in Christ. But I believe even as believers, if we present ourselves to sin, we will operate and become slaves to that sin again. But we've been set free from that sin to be obedient to Christ. And I was walking in ignorance, and I was definitely enslaved to my sin. At least I was operating that way for sure. I couldn't let go, and it made me, made me absolutely miserable. Anybody ever read... 
um, the book Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. I think I've spoke about that in here before. Great book if you haven't. Um, um, I, I recommend reading it. It's old, so if you get the original version and you're not used to King James language, it's going to be that type of language. But they do have uh, um, Pilgrim's Progress in, in uh, modern English as well. So uh, either way, uh, I encourage you to get that. There's also an audio version uh, that is really good, but uh, I highly recommend that book. Um, it's actually the most read book in history outside of the Bible. Note that. Um, but in the story, there's a man named Christian, and he has this huge burden, like literally on, on his back, and it's weighing him down. And that's exactly how I felt. I felt like Christian with this huge uh, burden on my back, and it was, it was crushing me, and I hated who I was. I was full of guilt and shame. So fast forward, um, Courtney and I ended up uh, together in, 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 uh, in grad school, as she was going to grad school, rather, um, back in Nacogdoches. And um, after she finished grad school, we, we moved home and we got married in 2003. Um, there was a, a, one of our, two of a, another couple, or some of our best friends, they had, uh, they had asked, um, they had invited us to their small uh, church, a small, thriving church uh, called Freedom Fellowship. And as wedding gifts, they had given us the Purpose uh, Driven Life. Um, it's a book. And on our honeymoon, we had decided, okay, let's start reading this book together. All right. So we had always had this plan. During college, we, we were never in church, and it was all excuses. We made excuses why you know, we didn't want to go to church. But the plan was, when we get married and we get our lives together and everything is right, then we'll start going to church. And so that was the plan, and we did. Or, you know, I remember on the plane uh, to our honeymoon, we're like, hey, when we get back, we're going to church. Let's start reading this purpose-driven life. Uh, together and God uh, used that book one, but um, also we got back and 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 we got into uh, to church and when we did the first Sunday I had a lot of questions um, because of my upbringing again it wasn't that it was all bad but I there was like I had a lot of questions I had a lot of things that I like I don't want this type of church or this type of preacher or whatever and and. And I already kind of started, my mind started to turn like with questions and I wanted answers like biblical questions and stuff like that, man. But a lot of my questions about the church were answered that next Sunday. And so I saw that as a, as a, a, a sign from God and we fell in love with the church. We loved the atmosphere. The atmosphere was actually a lot like this church. I think this church is a lot like it is, like from my part, you know, from the role I play because of of freedom fellowship and that's just the way the style just how we're all very laid back and, and loving you know and stuff like that there's a lot of young people in the church and, and I just love the church um, and so we got involved I volunteered my graphic design skills uh, to the tech team I did what Joseph and and Sean uh, do back there that's why I relate to them so much um, and I learned more in the first few weeks of that church than I had my whole life and uh, it gave me a hunger for the truth. And things were going really well. Our plan had worked <laughs> perfectly, right? We, we'd planned to get back in church. We did. And, and uh, things, we loved the church, and, and things were going good. I remember that burden that was on my back. It hadn't gone away. I was carrying a secret. <laughs> uh, and I just, what I did was I just threw a blanket over it. I was just hoping that it would disappear and it would just go away. It's like, hey, God forgives me and throw a blanket over it. Whew, you know, it'll just all go away. Um, Proverbs twenty eight thirteen: whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. David writes in Psalm 32, he says, for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Man, this always speaks to me. My bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of the summer. But I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. You see, I had all this guilt and shame um, built up that I hadn't 
dealt with. And I was hoping that I would just eventually kind of forget about it, right? And I would just take all that stuff to the grave with me and everything would be cool. But I had this problem. It wasn't just the guilt. The guilt is healthy. That was stuff I needed to deal with. But what, you know what was keeping me from, from, from confessing my guilt and really dealing uh, with that was what we call shame. And you all have heard me talk about it, the difference between guilt and shame. Guilt, I believe, is healthy, right? It leads us to say, I was wrong for this, right? I'm sorry for this, right? I make restitution for this, right? But shame says there's something wrong with you. You are unworthy, And that's that voice. I didn't hear an audible voice, but that's what was, I was consumed with it, right? You are not worthy, and that keeps you hiding, right? And it keeps you concealing like David did, right? But inside, internally, his bones wasted away. And that's the way that I, that I felt. I, I, I hadn't dealt with it, and I didn't want to deal with it. And the more I didn't want to deal with it, the more it drove me crazy. The more I felt that burden. And that scared me because I I would think to myself, I was like, well, how's God going to deal with me then? Could I truly be saved if I wasn't willing to give it all to him? These were the thoughts that went through my head. I've been lying to my wife. I've been lying to myself. I've been lying to God. And I tried to make myself right. That was part of like getting back in church, getting involved, right? And doing all those things. I was trying to make myself right. And I stopped all my sinful actions. You know, I, I don't want to stand up here and say, oh, well, Scott stopped looking at porn, you know, because it was just, man, God just burst on the scene and I stopped doing that. I stopped going to strip clubs, you know. When we got married, that was when I said no more of that. No more porn, no more um, strip clubs. That was all just a Scott action, saying I'm not going to do that stuff anymore. And so I didn't do it after, after we were married, right? But then also I'm preparing my life for these steps that we're going to take. We're going to get in church and we're going to do the right thing, so I'm getting my life all in order, and I'm trying to make it all right, but I was not all right. I knew I wasn't. And I remember <clears throat> one time Courtney and I, we had visited this larger church, and we went forward for prayer, and uh, there's a bunch of people that had gone forth for prayer, and they had different ministers up there praying, and when the guy came uh, to pray for us, he looked at me and he said, um, son, is there, is there something that you want to say? He says, I just got this feeling, is there something you want to say? And my mind screamed, yes. And I said, no. So we've been serving several months at our new church. We got there in the fall and it's now the spring. And, uh, An evangelist came, his name's Tony Nolan. He came and he spoke several nights at our church. Everybody just fell in love with this guy. He's a great dude. And one night he preached this gripping message on the sower and the seed in Matthew chapter 13. Let me summarize this for you to set the stage. There's this story that Jesus tells and he explains it to his disciples later. But there's a a, a sower with a seed and he goes and scatters seed everywhere. And Jesus says that that seed is the word of God, right? And so when that seed is scattered, there's some of the seed that the birds come and immediately snatch up. And he says, that's like the word being preached and it either goes over their head or they reject it, or maybe they're bored and just not even paying attention. But the word is just like, you know, it's just immediately snatched up. It just, you know, does nothing doesn't penetrate. And then there was this seed that fell on rocky soil and, 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 and that seed immediately sprouted up, right? It sprouted up immediately. So somebody like receives the word and they receive Jesus with gladness, praise the Lord, hallelujah. And all of a sudden persecution and hardship uh, comes in, in life. And when that starts to come, right, they, maybe they had in their mind or, or whatever that they thought it was all going to be roses, and then all of a sudden, hardship hits, and then they, they fall away. And then there is this seed that is, Jesus says it falls um, among the thorns, and it sprouted up too, much like the seed that fell on rocky soil. It sprouts up, but this time it says the thorns, uh, it, it chokes it, and he said that that that's the, the deceitfulness of riches, and it's the cares of the world. So like the good stuff in life, the worldly stuff, takes us away, and we drift off 
from God and we fall away. And then finally, there was the seed that fell on fertile soil and it grows. What's beautiful about it is he says that uh, some produce this much fruit, others produce this much fruit, some produce. But the point is, is that it fell on fertile soil and it started bearing, bearing fruit. It took, right? And man, he's preaching this message and I'm like, my goodness, my life, <laughs> up until here recently, it hadn't took. But, you know, we're good, though, God, right? Because I'm doing the right thing now, right? Got rid of all that junk. We're in church, right? Doing the right thing. Everything's, everything's good. And he gave an altar call, and all of a sudden, I felt this tug on my heart. Any of you ever felt a tug on your heart? Like when the word is being preached? That's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. And my beef was, is I hadn't felt that since I was a boy. I was like, God, okay, what are we doing here? <laughs> We're good, okay? I'm, 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 I'm serving on the AV team. It's all good. We're good. We've been coming to church faithfully. I'm reading my Bible. We're having fellowship. Worship you. Love you. We're good, God, right? What's going on? Why are you, why is this happening? <laughs> why am I feeling all this anxiety pulling me towards the altar, And then my mind just suddenly flashed with all the sins that had caused my burden. And man, I wanted to do just like I did with that minister that one day. <laughs> just say, no, God said it ends here, Scott. Not an audible voice. The Holy Spirit speaks to you. It's through your thoughts. It says, Scott, it ends here. Either you're going to follow me or not. I'm not taking you further until you deal with the sin. I can't take you further because he gives us free will, right? He says, I cannot take you further until you deal with this. And man, I was still, I was still fighting. So the altar call it happened. We've all, you know, it's old fashioned uh, altar call. We don't really do those here, but you know, every eye closed, every head bowed, you know, nobody's looking, you know, raise your hand, that kind of stuff, you know, and then everybody sits down, opens their eyes and you have everybody come forward that had raised their hand. And, um, Suddenly, Tony, the evangelist, he goes, you know, I don't normally do this. He's Baptist. <laughs> He's like, I don't normally do this, but I feel strongly that God is saying that there are two more people that need to be up here. My eyes were closed. My heart was pumping, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. And I was still fighting God. I still wasn't going. I was like, no. I mean, just all kinds of stuff, fighting God, embarrassment, all this kind of stuff, you know, all together. And he finished the altar call. And my eyes open, and I look up, and everybody that was standing up front were believers. And I guess, I, think, I feel like God met me where I was because I was like, man, God, everybody's going to think I'm, I'm, I need to be saved or something, you know? And everybody that was standing up there was like, wait a second, they're all like believers. What's going on here? And God said, go. And so the altar call was done. Everybody's, you know, standing there and stuff. He's done. And like, I get up and I walk to the front and I remember my pastor, he's sitting on the front row. He turns around, he's like... And he gets up there, he puts his arm around me, he's like, hey, you coming for uh, salvation or rededication or what's going, you know? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> so I stood up there with my father-in-law and mother-in-law, my wife, and two of our other, there was two or three others uh, that were up there. I knew them all. And... Uh, and I asked if I, uh, I remember asking my pastor that night, I said, can I be rebaptized? That was my choice. Just like here, I don't ever, you know, there's people that have gotten rebaptized, but I don't believe in like, you got to be, you know, baptized every time something happens in your life, you know, you be rebaptized. Some churches will do it. Like you join their church, you got to be rebaptized. I don't think that's much of the case anymore. Hopefully it's not. But um, I asked to be rebaptized because something was stirring in me like I had never experienced in my life. And several of us were. We were, all, we were all baptized the next day in a, in a horse trough like that, uh, exactly like that. Uh, that's what I was baptized in. Um, everybody was celebrating, but it wasn't over for me. Um, God wasn't going to let me sleep until I confessed 
some things to my wife. I had no choice. And I knew it from the moment I got forward. That's the reason I was fighting. It's one of the big reasons I was fighting because I knew if I make that trek up front, I'm going to have to confess some things to my wife. I didn't want to face her. I had no choice, though. It would be a long night. James 5, 16 says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And a miracle happened. Something I'd long for for a long time. I was forgiven and God had already forgiven me because I had told him all the time, Lord, please forgive me. And the first time I said that and meant it, he forgave me. But I hadn't forgiven myself. And my wife forgave me. I still don't know. I'm not saying we had, you know, I'm not saying we didn't have struggles after that. But a lot of people, when you, you know, when you face the music, it's going to, there's consequences for our actions. It doesn't mean God, God doesn't love us. But, you know, <laughs> there's consequences. But, man. She told me later that God told her before I even said anything, that like, whatever he confesses, forgive him. I'm not putting that on her. Not my place to. If she don't forgive me, that's, it, there's no way. It's all me, you know? That was everything I had done. And I cried like a baby that night. I've never cried so hard in my life. I wept. I wept and I wept. Any of you ever had a breakthrough, like whether through counseling or whatever it is, and you have this breakthrough and you just release, and it was a huge release, and it was gone. That burden was gone. And I've never felt like, I've never felt anything like that in my life. And I'm not thankful for what I'd done. I would take all that away in a heartbeat. But I'm thankful that God allowed me to feel the burden because a lot of times we know, and our salvation is real, but we know that God forgave us. But I'm so thankful he allowed me to feel what the burden of my sin felt like. That when it was released, I literally felt it leave me. I was healed. And I knew my sins weren't counted against me. I knew that. Remember, they, they already weren't counted against me, but I knew it. For as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. And Paul says in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I've never felt so grateful in my life. And for the first time, I truly understood God's grace. I grasped the cross. I grasped the resurrection. And the next morning, I just felt so alive because I was. I was free. Jesus died for my sins and he rose so that I could live through him. Because <laughs> he's alive, right? And the Holy Spirit he gives us to live in us. I felt rejuvenated. I was a new creation. And that became my life verse. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. And I remember the first time I read that as I was reading scripture, it just jumped off the page. I was like, that's me. That's who I am. That's right there. Right there. That's exactly how I feel. I'm a new creation. And the old is gone and I'm not picking it back up. The new has come. And that's how I began to identify myself. I wanted to know him more. I yearned for it. Out of that, uh, there was this great passion for him. And it was, for me, it was a calling to the ministry that came out of that. Remember, God knows. He was like, you can't go any further with me until you deal with this. And that's where he started to take me when I dealt with it. I'm not saying he takes everybody into ministry if you confess your sins. But that's what he did for me. And I just had this desire to see others know Jesus. I felt like Jeremiah. He says, if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name... There is in my heart as if it were a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. I cannot. And that's exactly how I felt. It was burning inside of me. Thank you. God has been there for me through the good, the bad, and the ugly.
By the way, thank you for that, but I drive he I dry heave tears. Mine don't come out like Brad's. <laughs> My emotions are all out of whack, but nothing's nothing's coming most of the time. God's been with me through the good, the bad, and the ugly, and and Here's the thing, my, my story and my testimony, though, it hasn't ended. Like, man, I could, I could go on. We're already, like, it's way past time. I'm sorry. I did it again. Oops. <laughs> Britney Spears, I didn't mean that. Sorry. <laughs> hey, let's refocus. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. Glad God has a sense of humor. Um, but here's the thing. My story, my testimony hasn't ended. Like, that's my, that's my salvation testimony, right? That's like God, the way he, like, where he, he met me. But I could, like, pick, I could pick up where that left off and tell you a whole other story. Like, through my experiences uh, the last time, week before last when I shared, I mean, you got a lot of my story uh, in that, right? And I've got the story of the last 10 years of the church and how God's just worked on me personally, not much less the church, you know? And, and my story continued after that. More, more chapters in, in, in my story. Um, but even then, like, here's the thing, is my story continues right now. And my story's not over. The last chapter hasn't been, been written in, in, in my story, I, because I still need God. It's, it's God's story through me, right? I still, I still need God. And here, here's, a, here's, a, here's a warning to heed for us Christians, because this is a virus that is big time in Christians. We talk about this in faith walking. A lot of, a lot of the coaches in faith walking, they talk about their biggest struggles when they're coaching the hardest people to, 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 to work with. You know what it is? It's Christians. It's Christians, and I believe it's because of this virus, not being authentic with our current struggles. Somehow we've got it in our head because we're new creations and we've been given the Holy Spirit that our problems have ended, and somehow we think that that's the way it needs to be, and so we present, we, we, we're fake. We put on a face and we can't be real and authentic with where we're at. I'm telling you, you won't continue the transformation journey unless you're real with your current state. It always works that way. It worked then in my story that I just shared. I had to be real with myself. But even now, you got to be real. God doesn't just magically take you on this journey. The Holy Spirit doesn't work that way. You've got to be real with where you're at now, and you've got to humble yourself before God, right? That's what surrender is. That's why faith in this journey is is constant surrender, constantly giving everything over to God, right? I had an attitude in that moment of, God, I surrender. Okay, you're my Lord. You're my King, and I'm going to follow you, and I surrender, but along that journey since then, and even now, God shines the light and says, Scott, here's another area that you need to surrender. You're not surrendering. Or, Scott, you've backtracked and you've walked over here into this area. And you need to surrender it. And get used to it, church. That's, it's going to be that way. <laughs> so our, 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 we still need God. <laughs> we still need God. He didn't glorify us, and even in heaven, we'll still need God. But he didn't glorify us when we, when we came to know him. He made us uh, new creations, but we still got to walk that out, right? And so there's areas of my life where he's still working, he's still using me, he's still showing up. It's a different chapter, but it's the, same, it's the same story. And by his grace, I plan to trust him, continue to trust him through the good, the bad, and the ugly until he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You may now enter the joy of your master. So we'll wrap it up. What's your story? We've got five people who've volunteered to share their story. I asked Luke for permission um, this morning. He's supposed to preach the week after next and to ask if he could be flexible and possibly move it back a week. And he said, yes, he'd gladly do it. And Um, So that gives us possible two weeks. Here's the thing. It's two things. We got five people. I'd plan for four, and then if there are more, bleed over into the next week. Um, Is uh, 
either A, we get, we get eight people who want to share, or, uh, or B, it also leaves room. Um, maybe we go even more weeks than that. I'm all for testimonies. I'm all for hearing your story. I'm all for us inspiring one another with the gospel and what God has done uh, in, in our lives. So don't, don't worry about, is there still spots open? Just let me know if you want to share. And, but also, guys, uh, for those five, we don't have to squeeze you all into to one week. So I uh, overheard Warren <laughs> this morning saying, I don't know if I can do 10 minutes. Um, and so that gives, you, that gives you a little fudge room, right? We can just, like, if we get through a few, we can just bleed it over into the following week. But uh, what's your story? Do you know Jesus? Uh, if you don't know him, your, your story begins. It's, it's, it's calling upon Jesus as Lord and Savior. And he, he promised, just like, just like Peter said on Pentecost, he says, believe and be baptized. Call upon his name. Trust him as Lord and Savior. And uh, he will give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. God will come and take up residence in you. Your sins will be washed away. Even if you don't feel like it, they'll be washed away as far as the east is from the west, and he'll empower you to live for him through his, his Holy Spirit. And then your journey is just beginning. But if you don't, and you don't need a priest, you know, I'd love to pray with you, um, but you just call upon the Lord and, and start that journey with him. And, uh, but if you do know him, then you have a story. Where did you meet Jesus? Where is he continuing to meet you right now? And, and maybe, you know, maybe some of that's a, a, a vulnerable place for you. And I get it. I get it. This was vulnerable for me. But I, I, I encourage you to reflect on that and then courageously share your story. Because people need to hear it. God's story in you is power. It has power when we share uh, in faith. We're going to call them transformation stories because we believe that testimony goes on. So we're we're taught to not just share our, our past story, right? But continually, like I'm, I'm encouraged to be vulnerable and say, "Hey, this is where I'm at right now. And that's where I want to be. That's where God's taken me, and I'm not there yet, and I'm getting there. You know, that's where God's taken me is to that place. And sometimes that's vulnerable because we don't want to talk about those those current struggles, right? And so past, present where God's taking you in the future. Um, when you tell those stories and when you're vulnerable and you, and you encourage, uh, when you do that, it encourages people. <laughs> it inspires people. People come to know Jesus from that, but then also Christians are motivated and inspired uh, by that to keep up. And you never know what, 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 what people are going through in life and where they're at. And man, when you share it, it's just what they needed to hear.